Welcome to the Cinephile Hissy Fit Podcast, the tirade-filled movie debate podcast hosted by two film critics, cool dads, and struggling teachers. I'm Don Shanahan. I'm William Johnson. We're damn glad to have you. Folks, this is all for tantrum's sake, where shared passions and high fives wash away any place for hate. In the end, we encourage you all to love what you love, but for now, the gloves are off and the hissy fit is on. I think we've got a good one. This week, we're talking about Iron Man 3, recommended by, I think, a bit of both of us, where I don't mind talking about it and you adore it, so this would be good. <laughs> Our format is this. The recommending lover, William Johnson, goes first. He will get five uninterrupted minutes to shower his praises and state his high-minded case and twinkle in the heartstrings of cute little tissue stuff. The hater, which is me, <laughs> follows with five uninterrupted minutes of their own to present their counterpoints with any manner of intellectual scorched earth. I'll be very kind. It's not that bad. Still, something had to be 23rd place. After that, we open it up for 15 oh minutes of shared conversation where the hissy fit really gets chippy. We hope you've got your judge's scorecard. I hope you can spell the last name of Shanahan because that's who's going to win. Folks, let's go. <laughs> William, how you doing, sir? Uh, really good, really good. It's been, uh, I'm teaching summer school. Do you teach any summer school? You said when I told you I was teaching summer school, you went, uh, oh, they got you. Um, yeah, they got you. No, uh, I, <laughs> I had, I had an offer to do so. Um, my job's year round anyway, where I'm the technology teacher, but I'm also the building's technology coordinator. So there's always something going. It's a year round contract. I could have taught summer school. I have to give everyone in summer school, their tech and their stuff. So I'm kind of working anyway, but just not doing the teaching and definitely not getting any of the extra money for it. So, oh, well, mm. no, um, I think we got here to Iron Man three of all the movie, you know, Marvel movies we could talk about. We went to this one. Because you looked through my letterbox, saw my Marvel movies ranked by favorites, and I'm pretty sure I got a ranking of favorites, and I've got a ranking, a ranking for best. And I admit, and I've talked about this in the show, I'm one of those people who normally, pretty well, separates the difference between favorite and best. And to me, and you chastise me, and I can't wait for the minutes we got to talk about it, I have Iron Man 3 as my least favorite MCU film. Out of all 23 we've got with a 24th one that I get to watch tomorrow. Um, but we'll go from Shut there. Up. So Iron Man 3 is a special <laughs> place in your heart. You are the lover. Go with the five yes. minutes of starting this off first. Well, before I start the clock, I just want to let you oh, know. Oh, for, oh, for oh, oh. Is, is this extra minutes here? Yes, it's okay. extra minutes. For people that go through Don's letterbox, yeah. just take a valium or something like because it is Aww, enraging like it you. is i i went through it and i just i wanted to like beat a baby seal to death with you know dead walrus it was very frustrating yeah because everything i looked at i was like though. i was like that's disgusting that's stupid yeah. that's a dumb opinion it, it was very frustrating but it was also good fodder for mm -hmm. future episodes so uh, That's right. Nothing, nothing pissed me off more than seeing Iron Man three listed as the twenty third ranked out of twenty three correct MCU films on his list. So, uh, I, I suggested we we talk about this because that's, right. that's messed right. up, dude. All right, so let's okay. go ahead and start the timer. Start timer is started. Fire away, sir. All right. So, where is my? There it is. Okay, this to me is the MCU's first masterpiece. Oh, dear God, you just dropped the M-word. I'm sorry to interrupt your interrupted minutes. Okay, go ahead. Go I know. Ahead, go ahead, go that's ahead. supposed to be uninterrupted, Dick. Uninterrupted. You get your 10 <laughs> seconds back. My bad, my bad. <laughs> now, while phase one of the MCU needed to mostly follow a formula, Iron Man 3, which came out directly after the Avengers and opened phase two, makes the wise decision of allowing the creators behind the camera to have a larger stake and take greater risks. Enter Shane Black. This is not a gun for hire studio job for him. This is a Shane Black movie. And thank the Marvel gods for letting it happen. Those, of, those who know me know that Shane Black is probably one of my favorite filmmakers of all time, if not my favorite, in terms of his writing output alone, let alone his directorial output. Um, basically, he's single handedly responsible for. I mean, maybe not single-handedly, but Iron Man certainly helped Robert Downey Jr., but Kiss Kiss Bang Bang reopened the ability to show the, ta the wide talent of what Robert Downey Jr. was. 
and what was lost due to his personal issues. Um, there is, uh, I read a review that basically someone said on Letterboxd that no one can write RDJ better than Shane Black. And that is absolutely true. If you do a double feature of Kiss Kiss Bang Bang and Iron Man 3, you are going to get some of the greatest, wittiest, greatest dialogue. It's, it's just fantastic to listen to. Um, the great thing about Shane Black films, especially The Nice Guys, which is in my top five of all time, is that no matter how many times I've seen it, I laugh out loud constantly. And Iron Man 3 is a very funny movie. Um, so instead of a third film in the trilogy playing like a greatest hits or trying to make up for any errors, quote unquote, of the much maligned second film, Iron Man 2, Black and company double down on what makes Iron Man and the MCU films in general work. And that is character. There is actually very little of Iron Man himself to speak of in this movie, but that is kind of the point because the franchise has always been about Tony Stark. And Robert Downey Jr. gives one of his best performances here as the anxiety-ridden, PTSD-afflicted Stark, who has realized the great power and great responsibility, wink, wink, he has extends beyond just the Earth, but also into the universe. I think at one point Guy Pierce says in this movie that once the guy with the hammer fell down from the sky, subtlety is dead. But I find that kind of ironic because this film actually tackles a lot of serious subjects besides the humor uh, with a lot of subtlety, stuff that they would not do later on. But I'll get into that later. Uh, my favorite element of all the MCU films are the hero's ability to be vulnerable. And while Tony certainly faced his demons in the past, the most confident cocksure in inventor has a crisis of self in this film, and it gives us a realistic drama and actual stakes. This isn't the perfect superhero. The flaws are what make us love him. Plus, the film does an amazing job of showing that, unlike Bruce Wayne or someone similar, Tony is not necessarily an action hero without the suit. Put into dangerous situations without his armor, he is liable to screw up. Unless, of course, a well-timed quip is required. Even if you don't love Marvel, but do love Shane Black, it has all the Shane Black moments you need. Christmas, quips, buddy comedy set pieces, genre-bending twists, and amazing action. This is one of the top on my MCU list, if not the top. Um, Shane Black, um, you know, like I said, was known for writing buddy cop things, but the best thing that is in Shane Black's arsenal is that he knows how to subvert the genre. Every film he makes takes a trope of the genre that he helped create with Lethal Weapon and subverts it. And Iron Man 3 is not devoid of that at all. There are plenty of surprises, moments of witty departures and subversion that happen when you least expect them, when you're expecting something else to happen. And that's another reason why for the MCU, which was still in its infancy at this point it was just entering phase two for it to have the balls to go out and think outside the box and to give us a very deep character piece um and something that is funnier than just quips and ironic humor there's something deeper there with the comedy it's almost like it's making fun of itself in a way by not taking itself too seriously so you know what my time is almost up Mm -hmm. wow I, I actually did it i actually did it at the yep. there, there is something i did not Crushed go into it. we'll go into that in the 15 minute section but not bad not bad you know you have a probably a smartphone somewhere where you can keep your own time too and just check i all i right. don't know i know i know all right five <laughs> minutes for me so i'll be the one that says it out front here this is not a full-on hate thing for me you know i don't think marvel has made a bad film yet uh, they're all different degrees of good to great to awesome. And when you start ranking them, something's going to be 23rd. Something's going to be number one. Something's going to be every number in between. And for me, Iron Man 3 is the least of such because of the f a few of the things that you're talking about, where it's, you say they kind of go outside the formula and bring and make a Shane Black movie. And I, and I get that, that Marvel brings in different creators to kind of spice a few things up and to, bring their flavorings into things. And sometimes that works and sometimes that doesn't. For the most part, I feel like the people they bring in to direct more often than not are yes men, you know, who come in, you know, see the different things that are possible, uh, take the story a little bit further, do their homework and deliver, you know, a solid piece. But it's not often that you see a lot of MCU films really stand out in terms of a certain kind of style. 
And that could be a good thing. That could be a bad thing. You, if you kind of veer a little too far away from the norm or the, the, the climate of such Marvel, that could be a little too far. If you are, you know, if it is boring and you are a gun for hire, that kind of makes a difference. And we've seen Marvel screw a few filmmakers over in terms of trying to get that, you know, it go ask Edward Wright how his Ant-Man movie went. And so for Shane Black to come in, I, fe- I feel like, and this is me conjecturing for sure, this is an RDJ hire. You know, he's coming off of phase one with all the clout in the world. He's the star. And, you know, John Favreau either doesn't have time or doesn't want to do a third one. And he's like, well, who, you know, RDJ, who we work for? Well, I'll work for Shane. Problem is, for me, when you do that, it, as much as you put the MCU flavorings on here, as much as you sprinkle in some action and some stuff and you, you call an Iron Man, this is a Shane Black movie. And I think that's the problem with it is a lot of these. A lot of the wit, a lot of the buddy cop stuff, a lot of the tropes that are his because, okay, fine. MCU has a formula that has been, you know, maligned by a lot of people who who trash the MCU. Shane Black has one, too. And he kind of makes a bit of the same movie every single time. And as much fun as that is, and there are definitely quips, there are definitely witty humor and all that. It just doesn't play in this setting. I'm not saying Shane Black can't make a movie. Guy makes great movies. Guy writes fantastic dialogue. Him and RDJ have something special. For sure. Love Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. But you get you bring that over here and it just doesn't work. Like you can, it's it's like a cover band showing up at the wrong festival. You might have this amazing, awesome Metallica cover band, but when they show up to the barn dance at the country music festival, no matter how good that band is, it ain't the scene, it ain't the setting for that. And I feel like that's what we have here with Shane Black. Again, I don't think it's per se a bad movie. It just, you call it the masterpiece label. (laughs) Hell no, not even close. So the places where this movie botches it is you do have that long, ugly middle where you don't get a lot of things done. You have a lot of, you know, mulling around. You have this weird little investigation of where these exploding villains are and stuff like that. And you got that cute kid who does get to show up and a nice funeral scene later, nice touch. And he does have some good repartee back and forth. It feels like it's from a different movie. And not that it can't be an Iron Man movie, it just doesn't fit where we're going. When you take that, and I'm not trying to be the comic book salesman in The Simpsons, but when you take that into the extremist story, and you bring in Aldrich Killian, and you, you, know, you give Pepper Potts more to do, which is admirable, you do all that, and it's a bad adaptation of that story where maybe it doesn't fit a movie. I don't know if this fits a third movie fit mixing in where, you know, where Avengers ended. The Mandarin stuff is an absolute missed opportunity and botch that I cannot, you know, um, condone for what this movie is. I, I get that it's a great rug pull and that's all in good fun. But you have his best villain from his history. And you botch it like that. Ben Kingsley, fun actor. The premise of where you're going with the rug pull is fine. But then you lay that on the Guy Pierce, you know, villain role where that's kind of where Aldrich Killian shows up. I'm the Mandarin and all that. Like, oh, come on. And then you have him, of course, start as the, you know, lame, ugly, duckling, Pygmalion, you know, she's all that kind of transformation, which is just dumb. Happy Hogan gets saddled and sidelined. Pepper's given more to do, which is nice. But between the lame villains, the mismatched stylings that can fit or not fit, I just can't go with it. Because by the time we have, you know, Iron Man shooting dudes up, he kills 14 people in this movie, you know, body count wise, which is kind of hilarious. And, 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 it's, it's, and it's gunshot up to face kind of style. And I'm like, I don't know if that really fits as a Marvel movie or a Tony Stark movie. And I, I see the, the arc of what they want to do in terms of the quirks and all that, because this is a quirky guy. But nah, man, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, the wrong cover band showing up to the wrong festival. <laughs> nice, nice. I, well, okay, so a couple of things to address here. So Yes, sir. Well, here, um, you have a big tangent you want to fill in first. You better go first. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into, I want to address some of the things you talked about first, and then, then I'm going to okay, talk about it. another topic, and I want to I hear your, your take on yeah. it. Yeah, and the um, 15 minutes are firing away here, just because then we're okay. honest. Sure. Um, okay. So first off with the Mandarin, I think that, um, yeah, I love the, uh, the rug pull as you call it. Mm -hmm. Um, and also I think that this is, uh, more of a reactionary take, um, because like all things Marvel, as it turns out, everything is connected in this universe and we'll actually find out, um, 
there's actually a short film uh, that came out uh, shortly after Iron Man 3 called All Hail the King, which was with Ben Kingsley. Uh, mm-hmm. It was one of Marvel's one shots, and it kind of explains that the Mandarin is still out there, the real Mandarin. Oh, sure. And as many, We're going to get Shang-Chi people, coming up here. Yeah. Shang-Chi is going to introduce the real Mandarin and the real Ten Rings. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I actually don't mind that because uh, there's plenty of things in the comic book realm where people are pretending they're Hydra or pretending they're one group and, and not sure. another or trying to. So I actually don't mind that very much. Uh, so yeah, but that that's, villain that's about- eight years too late. And, you know, even if you give them a lucky seven because of the pandemic delay, I, I, if you're going to play that long game, we're going to do that in a TV show, not in a movie. And they just perhaps, but th- then again, I, I mean, we're complaining it, of your sure, number but, two film in the MCU is mm-hmm. Avengers Endgame. That movie yes, cannot exist without ten years of buildup. So, oh sure, I agree yeah, with but you. watch us never get a real Mandarin, and watch us never get a real Mandarin that goes against Tony Stark because he's dead. So they botched it. Botched it. Well, I love the tough. setup of what it was. Like, if you're going to do a modern Mandarin without the magical rings and the green face and the cartoon stuff we've all seen. Yeah, right, right. make him an eco terrorist. <laughs> make him a guy who kind of you know does the viral video stuff. Loved the setup, you know, but then you don't deliver and it sucks. And I get that that's there to just fuck with us fans, and you know because Marvel, you know, we've seen that already in the current shows where they there's a zillion red herrings for the sake of having red herrings at this point. That's not the place to pull a red herring. I suppose, it just but work. we have to. Yeah. We also have to keep in mind. But then Alder Killian does no favors to fill in the the gap. Either. Yeah, you have to keep in mind though that the Mandarin is a super complicated, problematic character in itself. I know. It's very Good. hard to adapt spend, that character. Tell you what, spend two hours in that instead of two hours wandering around Tennessee with a little kid. Well, I think I think they did by Aww, basically making <laughs> making uh, Ben Kingsley kind of this goofy actor who's oblivious to what sure. he's doing, but also have an age uh, Killian uh, kind of take on this. Oh, I'm the Mandarin. Uh, and yeah. you're kind of playing with that trope that there are these boogeymen out there that exist, mm-hmm. and he's kind of playing with that trope, and really it's all manufactured. They kind of do the same thing in Spider-Man Far From Home with um, Mysterio, where it's all kind of, you know... Uh, yeah, but Mysterio kind of shows up. We get a real Mysterio moment in a real Mysterio Sort of, movie. but he's not really the oh, Mysterio no, no. That, that big lo- in the comics. That big London, th- oh, for the introduction for the first 15 minutes? Oh, sure. No, no, no. But then for, I, the, I but then for the hour after that, we have a real mi- Mysterio movie with a real Mysterio story, and it's fantastic. Uh, yeah. Debatable. We're, we're, I, I th- but I, I think if you're trying yeah. to be, you're saying that it's supposed to be a personal connection yeah. to Tony Stark and it's supposed to be more comic. No, 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 no. I don't, I don't need all that. Well, if you're going to. Okay. Well, here, now we're getting to the point where it's 10 pounds of sugar in a five pound bag. If you're going to do a Mandarin movie. Right. And you're going to do an Aldrich Killian movie. And you're going to do an extremist story. you got to pick and choose which of that's going to fit in a two-hour and 20-minute movie. Because all three don't. Especially when gotcha. you spend 30 minutes wandering in Tennessee with a cute little kid. It's, it's definitely busy. It's definitely a busy film. I, what I will oh, say about that's it, That's also though, Shane Black was, for you. It is, this, it is Shane Black. What really shocked me upon this rewatch, because I rewatched it. Um, me too. I've seen it a night. bunch of times. Um, is the action in this movie is incredible i mean absolutely i'll tip my head to that sometimes yeah i I think sometimes even me the marvel guy can Mm -hmm. get a little you know sometimes i do kind of you know blank out a little bit at some of the action scenes i think marvel's gotten better at making it more unique this was kind of the first one you know maybe outside of the avengers where i was like holy crap how did no i'll i'll tip my hat to that 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 malibu home destruction scene real real sharply done a lot of CGI, but really sharply done with the mix of slow mo, the trading of armors, you know, the the perilous situations. You have Pepper, you have Rebecca Hall's character all dangling in there. Like, there's some, there's definitely some peril there. And then, of course, the skydiving sequence is fantastic. Skydiving is amazing. You know? And then, the, especially the when the, the yeah, where you're like, oh, he did it all on remote control, which is stunning. You know, so that's a fun thing yeah. there. Problem is, for every one of those, you have, you uh, you got some dumb ones like. The Chinese theater explosion one with Happy just screwing around in a tourist location just feels like like it's from a cop show. It, it just dumb, dumb, dumb action sequence doesn't really go. I can even almost say the same thing about like the town fight feels like it's a CW show because you have this small little two street town fighting these weird little, you know, mysteriously powered baddies who just burn up stuff and have no backstory whatsoever. 
other than the one guy they try to investigate. And it it just seems less, especially after where you came from. And, and I know not every Marvel movie has to top the one that came before it, but this is Iron Man 3. And this is where we're getting to 10 pounds of sugar. Talk about that. Well, I... They they do do the extremist storyline a little bit better in Civil War later with the idea of these winter soldiers that were all built. Like they, they yeah, actually kind of repeat definitely. that storyline and they did it better in Civil War. So I'll give you that. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah. another uh in the end battle, um, I felt like I was watching Lethal Weapon five, which is why I loved it, because I'm a huge Lethal Weapon guy. So the I see what you're saying battle. where it kind of feels like it's Oh, all the armors of the dock. Yeah, 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 that's yeah, it's okay. Because cause when you have that gigantic set piece, just like Lethal Weapon 2, where they're in like mm-hmm. a, a, a storage yard, you know, yeah, with boats, yeah, yeah. it's very action film 90s. And I love that. That that, that person, I like it. But I can right. see your point of how that might be a little bit off yeah. the mark. Well, I, I, I'm also, and I, I don't mean to say that Shane Black is Terrence Malick, where he plays the same four, hand, four moves all the time. Right. But, right. It, you know... When you watch this movie, and if you've seen enough Shane Black movies and you've seen enough other things, this is inexplicably a Shane Black movie. I'm not saying a filmmaker can't have his art and his talent show up with, you know, some signature stamps and some things like that. Like, sure. uh, like I was saying with filmmakers where Marvel borrows a lot of talent, brings a lot of them in, and it's hard to see each person's talent really show through more than more than just their ableness to pull off the material. I, I don't think we've seen... Shane Black is a very distinctive filmmaker compared to the usual, I hate to say it, hired hands they bring in. The next sure. test for a person who's a very distinct visual or a very distinct filmmaker is going to be when we get Chloe Zhao and the internals, where I'd be very curious to see how many Chloe Zhao things come out of a, you know, show up in a Marvel movie while at the same time, can you still achieve being Marvel movie? So, I, oh no, no, I, I won't call Shane Black Terrence Malick. He's not a hack, but we see a little, it, it's, it's shame my first Marvel second, and that's where it screws up a little bit. But see, For I me, think that comes least. down to I think that comes down to like your taste because obviously you sure. don't like Malik, I do, so I dig that stuff. Shane Black, like I said, is probably my favorite filmmaker in terms of writer directors. He's my favorite. Mm-hmm. So getting an getting Marvel, which is my thing, and Shane Black together is like a dream come true. So oh, I get I can it. See you know, like if I'm I, biased, you know. Sure, sure, sure. Like I'm trying to think of a favorite filmmaker of my own where if they showed up and made a Marvel movie, I'd love it yeah, absolutely. But I also have to go. There's people who are favorite filmmakers of mine who who have no business showing up in a Marvel movie. Like for Barry Jenkins. Love Barry Jenkins, love his stuff. I know he's gonna make this weird little Lion King prequel or sequel coming up here and he's gonna take the big mm-hmm. studio paycheck. He loves Marvel, like, by the way. He's a huge Marvel guy. Right. But it, it, for him to show up in a Marvel movie, it'd be I you'd have to really like it you have to really sell me on that one. It'd be a tricky sell. Even Chloe Zhao is a heck of a like, really? We're gonna go there and this would be surprising come soon, but we're, we're deviating from Iron Man three. Get back to your stuff. Okay. Well, real quick, I was just going to say this idea of Shane black and hired hand directors. It always kind of surprises me because phase one, I, I agree with you about phase two and some of phase three, like Peyton Reed, not like a mm-hmm. visionary director. I love no, Ant Man, really. but not a, like not yeah. a visionary director. Uh, you know, Scott Derrickson I, did Doctor Strange, you know, stuff like that. I, but I agree. You, but Derrickson hired. brings the motifs of horror into a place where things get a little weird. The Russos sure. are hired hands for sure. They have a very non-distinct style before this, even since after it. I know we debated Cherry, but I, the Russos, if anything, this had the Avengers movies have created their artistry more than them bringing previous. I suppose, know, but they did. In. They did bring back a lot of practical effects and 90s style action to a CGI heavy franchise. I, well, I'll tip my hat to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good call. But anyways, the other thing, my, before my you is... get lost in, before you get lost in one more thing, the other thing I'll tip my hat in this movie that is a, an improvement from other Iron Man movies, I'll tip my hat to Tyler Bates' score. That score oh, really has a good bump, has a, like, actually kind of almost it's paint. Brian it's, Tyler, actually. Brian is it Brian Tyler, Tyler not Tyler Bates? Okay, yes. Brian Tyler. But yeah. no, Brian Tyler makes what feels like an actual like Iron Man, you can hum it in your head theme because one of the yes. knocks until one of the knocks until phase one kind of finished and phase two kind of got through was that Marvel didn't really have a distinctive sound that that mm-hmm. Avengers theme made by um, made by Sylvester kind of kind, kind of coming out of Captain America's music was just kind of we had one movie where that was kind of formulating and it felt good. And then, of course, you know, two phases later that Avengers theme finally sticks in our head. But for a while there, 
Marvel did not have a distinct sound see, the way see, that DC is- does. Like, because when you think of Batman, if Danny Elfman's music doesn't come on, you're you're lost in your head. When you listen, when you say the word Superman, if you don't hear John Williams' March, I mean, some of those things are synonymous. Marvel didn't have that, and I thought they were on the cusp of that when Brian Tyler had that really just bouncy little brassy center cue for Iron Man. And I was hoping that would stay around, and it kind of never really did, and it's a shame. I. I'm going to tie this into the director thing because this okay. is kind of surprised me. I think with popular culture, after a while, things blend together in terms of a consensus mm. because one, so there's two arguments you're making. One is that like Marvel kind of had these hired hands that do stuff. And then also that the scores weren't um, familiar um, yeah. or, or like, see, I, until, until Sylvester showed up, he made a no, Captain no, see, America I, motif you can hear in your head and yeah, then I have to brought it to Avengers, because, which is good. Uh, I never know how to say his name. The guy who did the first Iron Man would did a fantastic yeah, du- uh, Duwali, right? Yeah, it's yeah, a good score, um, but it's not. You don't go, oh, you don't hear it and go, is that? I? You have to ask yourself a double take, like, wait, is that Iron Man one? Like, it doesn't stand out the way other uh, things. To do. me, it does. To me, it does a lot. Now, yeah. I agree with you about Iron Man two and the Incredible Hulk don't have much of a thing. No, but uh, Patrick Doyle, who did the original Thor, yeah, and uh, Captain but those America, themes the didn't. Avenger, well, it, you know, it goes now here. Look at the examples we're bringing up. You bring in, in veteran composers, you get you get old school thoughts there because Patrick Doyle has been doing this for a long time. Alan Sylvester has right. been doing this for a long time. Those guys sure. know how to make and build musical moments. These new guys make a whole lot of filler. But they don't know how to make themes. And I'm I'm glad Brian Tyler got close. I just wish we were, were wish we would have got that two movies ago and had it, you know, coalesce this is beautifully. Early though, movie. this is this is one no. Of this is the last. Look at. This is the last Iron Man movie, though. Like, we'll never get another Iron Man. If we get another Iron Man movie and they bring back this music from Iron Man 3 seven years ago from Brian Tyler, we'll be like, oh, well, I think that's that old theme, but it's not exactly sticking around. So Vestry's one thing sticks around. That's all you need. My one point is also about the directors. I mean, you look at some Mm -hmm. of the directors that they hired in phase one. I mean, you got Joe Johnson, who did Captain America. He's mm-hmm. he did the Rocketeer. He's got a yeah. very distinct style. In- an intentional hire for that age of movie, yeah. Yeah, Louis Leterrier, who did the Incredible Hulk. It's a very gritty. People forget that's yeah. kind of a gritty action film. It is, and uh, that's Kenneth, a transporter Kenneth guy. Branna, Kenneth Branagh. That's a hell of gave a legitimacy to Thor. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and John Favreau. I mean, mm-hmm. that's not bad. I mean, that's not no, a bunch no. of hired hands. No, but I feel like they slipped in face too, though. Because I I don't think Whedon is as good as Favreau. The no, Russos Whedon, were unproven. This movie is actually the reason why I hate Age of Ultron. Okay. Because all of the character development in Iron Man 3, he ignores. I um, know. That's the other thing uh, is this movie doesn't linger very good. Wish it would. It, it pisses me off a lot because um, I think Whedon doesn't understand Captain America as a character. And then when mm-hmm. he kind of shits all over Iron Man 2, it's like, what the, f- yeah, what the yeah, hell? Yeah. Like, what are you doing? I agree. Uh, but, uh, you know, Phase 2 also got us James Gunn, you know? Uh, yeah. We got the Russos yeah. in Phase 2. Um, I can take any of the Russos, of course. I, I know, because you're, you're weird. But uh, <laughs> And then Phase 3 is when they started going outside the box a lot, like Taika Waititi, yeah. Ryan Coogler. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Anyways, uh, another thing I wanted to bring up with you, and I wanted to get your take on this. Um, okay. By the way, our, cl- yes. our usual 15 minutes are done, so this is a good sidebar to switch to the big topic I know is coming. Yeah, okay. All right, so, bonus time. Hit it. One thing I one thing I really love about Marvel films is despite the and this is this kind of applies to Star Trek, which we'll be talking about in another episode someday. There we go. Um I despite the fact that these are larger than life characters, the reason why Marvel as a comic appealed to me as a kid, and the reason why these movies affect me so much, is because they really know how to get down to the human level. Um, like I said, I, I, you know, when we talk about this stuff off the air. We hardly ever refer to the characters in their superhero IDs. We hardly ever say, oh, well, Iron Man did this and Captain America did this. We always go, Tony Stark did this. Steve Rogers did this. Scott Lang did this. You know, Bruce Banner did this. Um, I know that sounds kind of small, but that's a big deal because you're connecting with some. I think a lot of superhero films before the MCU, uh, su- Sp- the Spider-Man films being a bit, a bit different, the Batman films in the early days, 80s and 90s, are a little bit different, but for the most part, superhero cinema got hung up on the iconography of superheroes. It was more about mm. what the superhero is about. It wasn't talking about the human side. 
Tony Stark will always be Iron Man, but we always talk about Tony. We don't talk about Iron Man. That's and true. when I think of when I think of the best moments from the Iron Man films or from the Avengers films, it's never necessarily like an Iron Man action sequence. It's usually a, a Tony Stark moment. Um, that is a, definitely a big victory that Marvel has done. Yeah, now across the board, film, pretty much. Now Iron Man three. Now I'm getting some personal territory here, but mm-hmm. one thing that people with anxiety, doubt, um, kind of a crippling sense of self have is they, they cover these things up with humor. Iron Man three on its surface is a comedy and it's very funny. But one thing that really affected me uh, about this is I'm a person who I have, I have clinically diagnosed obsessive compulsive disorder and I have very high anxiety. Um, so I suffer a lot of anxiety-based issues in my life. The thing that Iron Man 3 really tipped me off was its ability to show, without being grandiose or melodramatic, the idea of someone, no matter their wealth, no matter their power, no matter anything that makes them superior to the average viewer, the fact that they would struggle with anxiety and have panic attacks was something that really made me feel seen because Mm -hmm. I've covered up a lot of my anxiety with humor because it's a lot easier to push aside what you're feeling and make a funny joke. True. And I think, I think you are very good at that. I I think, (laughs) I think that um, Avengers Endgame would attack this in a less nuanced way with Thor. Um, Yes. His, his is a little bit more broad. He definitely has some, effective emotional issues that I agree with and I identify with. But Iron Man three really did a good job of showing you this small moments where, for instance, he's just sitting in a car and suddenly he's like, Oh shit, can't breathe. Can't breathe. can't do this. You mm-hmm. know? Um, and there, there's also this great moment where you know the kids on the phone with him and he's like, I didn't mention New York. And he goes, now you just said it by name. Mm-hmm. You still have that <laughs> humor kind yeah. of still. And all the way he, through your pants. the ways he dismisses the little kid all the time, like you know, I'm just gonna leave you just like your dad, you know, and like there's there's definitely the, the cover up edge there for sure. So I I I also very I connect on a very personal level to this because if there's anyone that I th- imagine James Bond having a movie where suddenly he has moral qualms and uh, anxieties, yeah, I and call that issues. Casino Royale. Yeah, exactly. So. You could, and Casino Royale is my second favorite Bond film of all time. Oh, mine too. Uh, so, so it's it's kind of like, well, we third. need these kind of stories to be told with people. And I mm-hmm. think when you have something this popular, something this m- mythological, mm-hmm. to have a human element to it is very important. Yeah. So I think underneath the quips and the witticisms and the amazing action sequences and things like that, the fact that Iron Man 3 can speak to me personally Mm-hmm. is another reason why I rank it so high because it's a very yeah. personal film to me. See, I can't knock that. And that's where I'll, you know, this is a good extended minute, you know, good extended set of minutes for closing. So no, if, like I said, I don't think Marvel's made bad films. Um, something had to be 23 and that was this one. And uh, no, totally Tour of the Dark Grant. World was 22, dude. What the Tour hell? Of the Dark World was 22. I, I <laughs> just had, I lap, I had more fun. Simple as that. Like I, I, I watch this movie and I'm just, yeah, it just a lot of the stuff misses for me. A lot of the stuff feels like just a, you're throwing everything you can into the soup and into the culture and trying to stir a bunch of things up. And some of it's cool, some of it's different, some of it's, but a lot of it just doesn't work. And then it's it, it's the villain. It, the number one yeah. thing that knocks this for me is just the two bad bot, botched villains. And when you get to, if this yeah. is supposed to be your and at the time, remember this was our this was supposed to be kind of a bit of our, you know. Tony Stark. Well, I don't want to say Tony Stark, but our RDJ solo movie send off. Like, I, if I remember yeah. correctly, the rumors were there that this was his last solo movie. He would show up in the group stuff and and call it a day. And he's obviously shown up in a ton of things since, and we know where his character arc ended. And right. but if this is his send off, and and you botch the Mandarin, you just ah, unforgivable mm-hmm. to me. I don't know, but uh, but I gotta I gotta tip my hat to you, and that if a movie makes you feel seen, and a movie makes you feel not just seen, but identified in a great way. And like, Hey, these people can have that too. I'll never knock that. Send file, here's if it or not. I'll never knock that. Glad you found that. 
Thanks. Well, my last thing I'll say real mm-hmm. quick, and then we'll quit because I know we're going over time. Um, we have to put this in the context of Avengers. Okay. They had to find some kind of way to make this street level enough that the Avengers would not be involved. True. Um, that's something I mean, cool all in the you, Dark World. You, yeah, you all all you get is 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 James Rhodes as your as your ex your buddy cop. Um, the post credit scene is worthless. You know, this is the, easily the least loved post it. credit scene. Oh, it's Fantastic. cute for a, it's cute for a little joke, but it does nothing to extend anything further. But that's character so, moments, though. That's a character moment. No, it's that's that's not. what's great. I'd rather have that no. than uh than like than Captain Marvel, Marvel, where well, he, it's better than eating shawarma. It's better than Captain Marvel goose. Uh, you know, coughing up the Tesseract. It's better oh, than no. the Captain America the joke. Matters. Yeah. It's, it's, I know. Oh, okay. Oh, the Captain America joke is the best one in my opinion, but that's another story. But no, 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 no. Spider Man um, Homecoming? No, I'm with you. Yeah. But no, I'm with you in terms of context where, and this is where the, we've talked about this in little hints in other places where that's the mistake the X Men movies make over at Fox is they feel like they have to go bigger and bigger and bigger every mm-hmm. time and they just don't understand that. The, some of the best X-Men stories are the little ones. Tell a Morlock story. Tell, you know, something small and, like you said, street-based. This is indeed a street-based Iron Man movie. And maybe that's a bit of a come down when you come out of, uh, you know, Avengers. But, yeah, it, 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 you needed to do that. And each of the movies that are in Phase 2 do that, other than the larger introductions like Guardians of the I would Galaxy. say Thor the Dark World does not, because London is, like, completely under attack by a gigantic right, right. Well, ship. Uh, you and I'm like, where's have, the Avengers? I mean, you've got L, you've got. I know it's just his Malibu compound, but there and but it's global terrorism in this. So the, sure. oh yeah, yeah. The, the height is there no matter what because it is Marvel because he's big hero. So sure. All right. All right. All right. Close this up. Let's there. agree to disagree, my friend. Um, I can agree to disagree. Like yeah, I like uh, yeah, like, yeah. For you to no no for you to feel seen and feel good feel something out of that. If there's a Mar, you know when there's a Marvel movie that does that for me, I'll never knock that. But at the same time, oof. I get you. I know. I, to- I totally get it. You're definitely not alone. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm more on the minority than anybody else, which surprises me that people love Iron Man so much because Iron Man oh. two and three are pretty uh, divisive. They are. I, 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 one last knock. One last knock. Because I gotta, yeah. I gotta squeeze this one in. Okay. That ca- that khaki fucking armor is hideous. The 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 Iron Man the Iron Man armor by Dockers. It looks horrible. Like if you're gonna do the reverse tone, where you're gonna place the yellows of the reds and the reds for the yellows, fucking paint it yellow. Don't do the Dacky's cocker or the da- the I, Docker's khaki. <laughs> horrible, I, horrible I armor. Mind, I didn't mind it. Uh, I like it if you paint it yellow. I don't mind it too much. Uh, this this would be an excellent sidebar. But what's your favorite Iron Man armor? The suitcase one from Iron Man Two. From Two. Yeah, me yeah. Too. that that red yeah. one with the, That's the red, cool. and the, white. red and, the red and silver and the red and white. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, obviously the functionality, the functionality and the fun of that is is just a blast. Yeah, but I not the not the Dockers, not the Dockers khaki one. And now because <laughs> I've made this point, you will never not see Dockers and khakis when you look at that fucking heart. God damn it! <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Right, Great right. place to end the show. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I, at least we could agree on the armor part, so we're not all enemies. That's um, right. Outro. I just thought I'd say outro out loud. Follow us on Twitter at Cinephile Fits and on Facebook at Cinephile Hissy Fits Podcast. Also, find us both on Letterboxd. If, like I said, if you want to have a enraging time on Letterboxd, go to go to Don's. And if you want to, if you want to feel lost into cheap horror, go look at Will's. <laughs> maybe just maybe. We will post a poll matching this episode for you listeners to weigh in mm. on. I actually think this is the first time we should, because I think this will be a divisive enough opinion. I agree. Because this is I one t- of the highest grossing films of all time. So it I is. think that people have seen it. Um, mm-hmm. You're in charge of Twitter. Fire it up. All right. So thank you so much for your captive audience and social media participation. Cinephile Hissy Fits is a 25YL media podcast. It is brought to you by RubinationsRadioNetwork.com. Please visit, rate, review, and subscribe. If you enjoyed this show, we have more where that came from with interesting hosts. And I can confirm we will have wonderful guests because we are opening up the playing field, my friends, to guests. So look forward to that. We have some fantastic people we got lined up. We need some tiebreakers in here. Yes, sir. (laughs) All of this stuff is available on iTunes, Spotify, and anywhere you find your favorite shows.
Do you ever find yourself sitting at the bar, beer in hand, watching the four o'clock Jacksonville Jaguars game, doing everything you can to beat your coworker's half brother in fantasy football? Well, 25 Yards Later is here to help. We're a fantasy football podcast with top-notch analysis, earworm music, and plenty of laughs. Each week, we dive into four games, putting every fantasy-relevant and occasionally fantasy-irrelevant player under a microscope. Block out all the haters with 25 Yards Later and make sure that Chad knows that he isn't the best. Available everywhere you get your podcasts.